For several years, I have been visiting Lesbos, a beautiful island in Greece that became a symbol of refugee suffering in 2015 when the body of three-year-old Syrian boy, Alan Kurdi, washed ashore. Today, thousands of refugees are trapped in the Moria refugee camp on Lesbos in horrifying conditions, including families with young children, single women, and people with disabilities. I have met people fleeing the war in Syria, fighting in Afghanistan, repression in Eritrea. They seek freedom from fear and violence. But European countries have built walls to keep them out. As winter sets in, they are stuck in Lesbos, deprived of their most basic right to humane and dignified treatment. The mistreatment they have endured at home or in Greece causes long-term trauma. People I interviewed described constant fear, feeling depressed, too many have no hope. Many cry uncontrollably in front of me. I know how they feel. I was seven when war broke out in my home country, Bosnia and Herzegovina. I know what happens. First, the trauma of fleeing. My hometown endured ethnic cleansing that expelled an entire community. Soldiers tortured and killed. My family, like many others, fled. We escaped in the dead of night, leaving everything. Back then, I was sad because of all the books and clothes and toys I left behind. I didn't understand how lucky I was until I wasn't. Three months later, my father was killed. It was the most overwhelming and suffocating pain in my life, and it still is. Then it was my grandfather, then my best friend Ilma. She was only nine. Then you just stop counting. In October 1994, just before the third winter of violence and hunger, we had to flee again. This time we were going to Sweden and would finally be safe. But getting to Sweden took months of unspeakable hardship. Hardship that left an imprint of feeling inadequate and unwanted. At Human Rights Watch, I focus on an often invisible group, people with disabilities. I was an 11-year-old refugee in Sweden when I saw a child with a disability for the first time. I was puzzled. Why have I never seen a child with a disability back in the former Yugoslavia? Like never, not one single child. The members of my community said, because we don't have disabilities. It was only many years later that I learned the truth. All across former Yugoslavia for decades, children with disabilities were separated from their families they were separated from their mothers at birth and placed in institutions where they would stay till they die. As Kim mentioned earlier, five years ago, she traveled to one of those former countries of Yugoslavia, Serbia, and found herself children with disabilities hidden in an orphanage, isolated and separated. And as Kim said, that's also how we met. And that's when we started working on this issue to document and to investigate what really is happening to children with disabilities in the countries of former Yugoslavia. We haven't only investigated what's happening, but demanding that these countries end confinement of people with disabilities. Today, we are also going to be talking on an even more invisible group, and it is refugees with disabilities. And that's what my research in Greece focused on. And that's exactly how I met Nujin and Nisrin. And I would like to invite them to the stage now. Uh, so when I was in Greece with Human Rights Watch, we found that even though the situation was difficult for everyone, refugees with disabilities literally could not even access basic services such as sanitation or shelter. They were completely left behind. 
I reached out to eight different international and national humanitarian organizations, including UNHCR, MSF, Norwegian Refugee Council. And my first email to them was, I would really like to speak with someone who can tell me about the situation of people with disabilities, of refugees with disabilities in Greece. All eight of them responded similarly to me. They said, we are happy to talk with you. However, we do not focus on refugees with disabilities. Back in 2015, I couldn't identify one single organization that was providing any support to refugees with disabilities. So we definitely, and at the same time, we also investigated that the European Union had put in more than 300 million euros in humanitarian response to Greece. So why were refugees with disabilities left behind? Um, and that's something that we are going to talk about today, but I wanted to also now introduce Nujin and Nisreen. Um, so the way I met Nujin was after my research, I learned about her journey. I learned that exactly when I was doing the research back in 2015, Nujin was in Greece. She was escaping Syria. She crossed the Aegean Sea and was a refugee in Greece. And BBC did interview her, and she was just incredible. And I was like, how do I meet this woman? <laughs> and actually, back then, Nadine was a child. She was only 16 years old when she escaped Syria. And Nisreen uh, was her sister, so they were escaping together. And so what I did was, literally, I was chasing Nadine down, and I found her on Facebook, and I reached out to her, and I told her, I need your help. I need you to be the advocate of refugees with disabilities. You are going to do it much better than I will ever. So Nadine has since then became an amazing advocate for the rights of refugees and for the rights of refugees with disabilities. She is the first person with a disability to ever have had the chance to testify before the UN Security Council, so the most powerful table in the world that sits at the UN in New York. She was the first person with a disability to testify. She was also the first Syrian, because before then, Russia would block every single Syrian civil society briefer. So can you imagine? She was the first also Syrian since the beginning of the conflict to testify before the Security Council. And she was the reason why the UN Security Council adopted for the first time ever a UN resolution on the protection of people with disabilities in armed conflicts. Can, so since Rwanda and Bosnia, the protection of civilian has been one of the main mandates of the UN Security Council for the last 25 years. And they have many resolutions on the protection of children, of women, of civilians, and no mention of people with disabilities until this young woman testified. So it's really incredible. Nisran, who is um, another incredible young woman, a human rights activist herself, currently a university student in Germany, has her own also story to tell. So Nisrin was herself a university student back in Syria before the war started and her entire life changed. She's also the person who supported Nujin during her fleeing because what Human Rights Watch documented in many countries, including in Syria, is that people with disabilities were often left behind when attacks would occur because families, they would face a difficult dilemma. What do I do? Do I run the conflict? And, but do, do I take my person, my, my family relative who has a disability with me and they might slow me down? We might get killed, both of us. So we have documented in many countries how people with disabilities are always left behind. But this screen didn't leave her sister behind one single time. So uh, we will talk about their journey. <laughs> Uh, 
And um, so I wanted first to ask um, Najin a question. Um, and um, like, Najin, could you tell us um, what did it mean? What did it mean for you to escape the war in Syria? Um, it meant a journey to the unknown, because I'd never known anything besides my room in, uh, in our apartment in Aleppo on the fourth floor. I didn't even attend school when I was younger, and um, but it also meant meant excitement and adventure. It was. It was something new that I was going to experience, and I was very much looking forward to, you know, starting a new life and actually having the ability to look forward to my future and have, having the ability to dream, as uh, as all my as all my siblings had, of having a career, a life, being successful, having friends, going out. So I had kind of mixed emotions and. Um, I think my approach to the whole journey was a bit different from anybody else because actually the, this journey to Germany was my first, you know, you know, my first look out into the world and I was looking forward to discovering new things. So maybe if I can just add here, so Nudine, she lived with her family on, in an apartment in a lab on the fifth floor. Uh, and there were no elevators in the building. Um, and as Najin had a disability and the infrastructure was not, in access it was not accessible, um, she, she did, and we talked about it a lot, she spent her days um, staying home. But what's really incredible is the resilience that even, in, in, even when she was spending that time just staying at home, she watched movies and learned English by herself and honestly I've never met someone who, who spoke English so well and who learned it all by herself being literally um, feeling literally just staying at home and, and not gone to school. Um, so Anistrin, what, what did um, escaping Syria mean for you? Um, بداية الحرب كانت إنه كل شيء تعلمناه ونحن كل شيء تعلمناه بكل مسيرة سنة صار صفر وبدك تبلش بشيء جديد ما عاد طبعا الموت والقتل والقصف. What meant is uh, death and killing and uh, has to forget everything that she had learned there in Syria and uh, she has to run away, escape. بداية الحرب إنه تفقد كل أشخاص بتحبهم. Uh, also, the loss of uh, all friends, relatives, and uh, everything that you have uh, grew up with. And thinking about, so, uh, Najin and Nisrin, they, um, they first fled Aleppo uh, and fighting in Aleppo to the northern part of the country. Then they fled the ISIS fighting. Um, they fled from t Syria to Turkey and from Turkey to Greece, um, all by walking. And so as you can imagine, they have experienced a lot. Um, so what I would like to ask is really if you could pick one moment that was the most difficult moment during all this escape, what would that be? Um, uh, Well, the most difficult time was uh, on the border between Turkey and Greece. Uh, you're about to go on the boat. A uh, human trafficker is taking you to a place you don't know where you're going. Uh, there is no water, no food. You're just jumping on the boat and you don't know what you expect. moment that stands out. Um, I think I was detained for one day in Slovenia and um, we, we, had, we had gone off the usual route, you know, refugee route. Uh, we used to just follow groups, but now that the, now that the Hungary borders were closed, we, you know, um, uh, got, we had gone off the, you know, the, the usual course and 
Um, we, we were actually the first two people to get into Slovenia, and then we were detained in a kind of a military facility where you couldn't keep a phone. Um, there was like um, there were bars on the windows. It, you know, it kind of looked like I was like I was a convicted convicted uh, you know uh, um, a culprit or something. Uh, and um, yeah, we didn't know what what was going to happen. And um, at that moment, I felt how precious freedom was, um, and you know, and how, how how uncertain our you know the next step in our journey was. So it was that 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 would be the most difficult part for me. Um, and as you know, um, there are many refugees who are still being detained today, um, and asylum seekers, like including. Um, in our border country, in, in, in the U.S. Um, the one thing that Kim touched up on and something that always comes up um, is this power of sisterhood. And often, um, often Nisreen is portrayed by journalists and in videos as the one who has been pushing uh, Nujin's wheelchair and supported her to reach safety. But I wanted first to ask you, Nisreen, um, how much did you also rely on Eugene? Would you have gone through all of this on your own? Um. So, how did you help you in this situation? Is it possible that you can go one or two times or that you can help you in the same time? كوحدي كوحدي انا كان ممكن باي دوله حتى لو بتركيا كان فيني اسوي شيء لمستقبلي او اسوي شيء لنفسي حتى في الحرب كان انه لما اكون لحالي انه انا مسؤوليه نفسي بس لما نوجين معي لما بكون في قصف وما فيك تهرب بسبب انه نوجين ما بتقدر باي لحظه تنزل على الملجا او لما يكون في حواجز لما بكون الطرقات مسكره في تركيا كمان انه كل شيء مسكر ما في فرص حتى الشوارع مش مهيئه لاصحاب ذوي الاحتياجات الخاصه فكان هون صعب انه بتقدر نوجين تعيش بهيك بدول من عالم الثالث فينا نقول كان فرصتها الافضل انه تطلع لاوروبا يا وات شي سينج شي فيلت ذات شي كان دو اني ثينج ويزاوت تيكن هير ويز at the same time, whether it was uh, bombing in Syria and uh, how she go into uh, the underground uh, place to hide or uh, escaping through the border in Turkey. So she felt uh, that she, she has to help and stay and offer uh, moral and uh, physical support to her. And they supported each other. <laughs> انه نوجين كانت محتاجه انه تطلع من هالمنطقه الحرب لانه كهي كانت طفله وكهي من ذوي الاحتياجات الخاصه كان كثير صعب لها انه تعيش بمنطقه دائما صراعات also uh, she felt her sister nojin is uh, she's uh, disabled and uh, she need uh, lots of help to get her out from there and from the situation so she did her best to get her out Thank you, Nisreen. Um, and Ajeel, what, um, like, can you tell us just how much, how much did, did the fact that you had Nisreen during all this journey mean to you? What did it mean to you, like escaping together with her? Actually, uh, nothing has changed much uh, ever since that, you know, that time. Um, I still need her. She's still my best buddy. Um, and we still bicker and fight, but you know we couldn't give give up on each other, of course. Uh, but you know, it's obvious that it could not it could not have been possible without her. And um, I'm very grateful for it. Um, actually, I'm, I'm grateful for everything you know throughout my life. I you know, I've, as Nujin was you know when she was growing up, she was not just disabled. She um, she loved to, you know, watch tennis, football, you know, make, uh, do, uh, I pranked my siblings. I was so very naughty. <laughs> yeah. So I think the whole family participated, you know, the whole family has a part in making, making Eugene who she is today. So I'm very grateful for that. For that. 
Thank you. What's also really interesting about um, Nisreen and Nujin is that um, if someone can talk about the right belong, I, I honestly can't think of anyone else who can talk about it better. So, um, because it, somehow they have always been the minority. So, um, Nisreen and Nujin are Syrian Kurds. Uh, so, you know, like, uh, what I would like really to open the discussion about is what it meant to always be the minority, to be a minority as Kurds in Syria, as Syrian Kurds now in Germany where they live, as women, um, and uh, for you, Nadine, also as a woman with a disability. Would you like me to answer that? Yes. Please? So I guess being a minority, of course, is a disadvantage, but it te teaches you how to be a fighter. I mean, uh, I have fought for my identity, all my, all my, we have all fought for our identity as Kurds all our lives long. We spoke our language at home, even though it was forbidden to speak it in public. We still listen to our music, we eat our food. So, um, and we, you know, we're, we're, still, we're still fighting for it to survive. And as a person with disability, um, I've tried. Um, I absolutely despised, despised meeting people for the first time because I knew that, you know, subconsciously they were thinking, oh my God, she's never going to go anywhere. So I tried to prove them wrong, that I was doing something, that I was learning, that I was reading books, that I was, you know, um, watching documentaries and learning and growing mentally, if not physically. Um, so as I said, being a minority or being at a disadvantage um, might hurt you sometimes, but it teaches you how to be a fighter. So maybe a question for both of you. Um, like, do you feel like you belong in Germany? Um, no, when, when, you, when you talk about this, uh, we belong to the, uh, to the, you know, to, to the picture that is Germany. We are a part of it. So, what, what I mean by that is not we, we have not we have not we have not we have not merged and we have not lost ourselves. We have not lost our identity and what makes us different. But we have been we have become a part of the big picture, which is um, which I which I think is a, is a is a kind of belonging. Belonging does not mean uh, uh, losing what makes you special. It just means, you know, um, uh, melting into the background and being, uh, being your own special self in that, in the, in the big picture. Great, thank you. She said, do you feel uh, you belong? Do you feel that you're like in Germany? Do you feel that you're like in the system? Do you feel that you're like in Germany? كطلعنا لالمانيا انه كطلعنا لالمانيا ما كان خيار كان هو واقع انفرض علينا فرض انه لما ما تلاقي حل ثاني غير اللجوء بس لما وصلنا لالمانيا اي انسان بيحاول قدر الامكان لما تبلش من الصفر رح يكون في صعوبات بس بعدين رح يكون مثل ما اخذت من هالشيء رح تقدم لها الوطن انه نحن قبل ما نطلع المانيا كان في كثير حالات لجوء داخلي انه حاولنا قدر الامكان انه اخر حل انه نترك البلد بس لما بكون الخيار الاخير هو ترك البلد ولما وصلنا لالمانيا كمان انه قدر الامكان حاول نعطي لالمانيا مثل ما اخذنا well she's saying that her arrival to germany was not the choice of her she has to escape the war uh, but as they arrived there, they felt like uh, they are being, being part and they offer them all kind of help and support. And uh, they will offer in return as the time passed by uh, the same support uh, as well. Great, thank you. So um, as I mentioned also earlier, I have been refugee myself and actually maybe two years ago, um, Kim and I, we were talking about this whole movement um, in the world where everyone is now trying to say how, look at those refugees and how successful they are, how well behaved they are. And, um, and even myself, I fell into that trap. I heard people over and over again speaking about me as 
this refugee who got protection in Sweden, and look at her now, she's contributing to the society. And it made me feel so much, at, and I, I wasn't feeling good about it. I, 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 and I couldn't, really, I couldn't really understand immediately why. And then I realized the right to refugee protection Everyone deserves it. Everyone deserves to flee violence and attack and to find safety in a country, regardless of whether you are successful or not. It's, it, and this whole idea of putting so much pressure on refugees that they have to prove that they des deserve refugee protection is something that I feel strongly against because it shouldn't be, we, we do not put same kind of threshold on our own citizens. Why do we put it on refugees? And it's something that I've often spoken with Nadine about because she often speaks about being very grateful to Germany for the protection that, they, that she has received. And just um, like Nadine, I was just wondering, like, could you describe, like, how do you feel about is, is Germany expecting, or just the international community and everyone else, are they expecting refugees to behave in a certain way, to be grateful or ungrateful? And just if you could maybe draw a little bit on that. Well, uh, definitely. I mean, I still feel like I'm in a constant test to, to you know, prove myself, you know, um, to be a good citizen and a good, so, some other someone who was who was integrated himself into into the the, the society in a good way. I mean, um, I mean, we've also come to uh, come to view it as our duty to, you know, to kind of ch uh, change the perception that people have of someone of newcomers in general. Like um, we we try to make them less afraid and. Um, and we, we try to show that we have so much in common that we, that we can definitely adapt to our new, to our new circum circumstances and laws. And what happens is that when, but what happens is that when, when, when anything, when one person does something wrong, you feel the need to just raise your voice higher and say we are the majority. You know, the people who are trying to do good and try and to you know move on with their lives and you know be you know be good to germany and you know uh, offer something back to this country are more than the pe than the people who are, try uh, who are who are trying to ruin this image كمان انه لما بالاخبار واحد يسمع انه مليون لاجئ جاي على المانيا هالمليون هي مش مجرد نحن ارقام موجودين على صفحات الجرائد لهالمليون في قصه في ورا كل شخص قصه في ورا كل انسان ماضي ما فيك مثل سحر بوم بدك تدمجه بالمجتمع الغربي او اي مجتمع نزح اليه هو مو مجرد سحر الانسان بطبيعته متعود على شيء طول حياته فكثير صعب انه اندماج جديد بمجتمع ثاني um, she said uh, when uh, you see in the newspaper there is 1 million refugees uh, and over in Germany, it's just a number, but these are lives. Uh, there is a, a million lives, there is a past story behind it. Uh, the, you don't expect these million to integrate and to become the same like German overnight. Uh, it takes time to, to learn and uh, to get to, to adapt and, uh, to the new future that they are living in. Great, thank you. So uh, we also want to make sure that we have enough time for the uh, Q&A, as I'm sure you all have many questions. So um, I will just have the last question for Nadine and Nisreen, and that is, you know, how do you see the world and what aspirations uh, do you have for the future? Um, as for me, um, I hope to, con con to continue working you know, uh, uh, in terms of the, in the advocacy field for uh, people with disabilities and refugees. Um, personal ones, um, I hope to k get into university um, and then to study, uh, to study social psychology. As I, I always wonder why, you know, I, I love to know the reasons behind things and I think human behavior is one of, you know, the most fascinating subjects that 
uh, anyone could study. Uh, universal ones, um, some peace would be great <laughs> around the world. Um, yeah, because, yeah, I'm, ti I'm, ti I'm tired of war. Seriously, I'm very, very tired of war, prejud prejudice and hatred, inequality and injustice. Oh, because I'm so tired. شخصي كمستقبلي بعد دراسة أربع سنين في زي في في سوريا أنا هلا مضطر أعيد أعيد دراسة السنين الأربعة باللغة الألمانية وبشكل عام كنوجين اليوم فيها كمؤسسة نوجين بشكل خاص إنه مساعدة الناس اللي دول جوار السوري بمناطق الحروب أن نقدم لهم ولو أشياء بسيطة يخطروا فيها يسهلوا حياتهم لأنه الإمكانيات الهنيك المتوفرة جدا جدا قليلة بالنسبة لدول العالم الأول وكنوجين كأنه اليوم كإنسان فيها تستخدم صوتها أنه نقدر قدر الإمكان نحاول نوصل للعالم أنه في ناس محتاجين أنه هنا مش عالي على المجتمع بالعكس أنه فيهم يقدموا شيء أفضل نسرين well, says uh... The future of her sister organization is to help uh, people with the disabilities and in the same situation like her, uh, give them support in the neighboring countries around Turkey, Libya, Lebanon, and uh, north of Iraq and Kurdistan as well. Um, offer them the support that they couldn't get while they, they were there. Also for her personally, uh, she had to she, see the future to study in the next four years in the German language and repeat what she studied in Syria. So that's her personal uh, future for uh, the coming year. Great, thank you both. So we got some questions and um, as you write them down, um, Celine or Jess will bring them over here so we can ask um, Nudine and Nisrin. And just before I dig into these questions, I only had one more question for Nudine. And uh, I don't know about you, but she, she's really one of the rare people that I've met who have testified before the UN Security Council. And I just wanted to ask you, how did you feel being in that huge room that we all see on the TV quite often when we have all these five power member states discussing the situation in the world? How did it feel for you being there? Uh, very stressful, but I was, I was so honored. Oh my God, I was, I was just so honored to, you know to have you know to, um, to, you know to have the ability to be the, vo the voice of people with, with um, disabilities in our in armed conflict um, I never expected myself to be in such a place but um, you know um, you know I love to take charge and and you know t um, tell politicians that they and decision, decision makers that, that they should do something and with the resolution, with the resolution that we uh, managed to get get out of there, I think it was, I think it was quite a success. So it was very nerve-wracking, but um, this was like uh, it was one of the pr uh, things that I would pr be proud of for the rest of my life. And so are we, really, proud of yourself. Uh, so we have a question from the public, and one of them is, um, what does a future of belonging look like to you? Can you describe it to us? To, to me, belonging is, belonging is, you know, um, is losing that label of refugee, not, not, not in a, in a figurative sense, not in a literal sense, but in just the fact that I would, um, I would like people to, you know, to look at me and forget, look at us, um, and you know, see what we, what what we will become in the future, and uh, and what all of you can do, uh, without going back to that first oppression or label, and. Belonging also is just having having that curiosity and respect for the uh, for for what makes us the di different but equally beautiful. So belonging means, you know, not uh, uh, not having so someone frown at you when you do something very culture 
or not having someone, you know, kind of criticizing you for not um, following uh, following uh, certain cultural norms. So that's that's the kind of belonging I wish for all refugees around the world uh, that they are accepted for their unique uniqueness and celebrated instead of being just you know um, put in a, around a corner and um, you know st staying there. Ms. Reen, do you have anything to add on belonging? كشخص ذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة إنسان مثل أي إنسان في عنده نقص بس ممكن بشيء تاني يقدر يعوض هالنقص ما رح يكون عالي على المجتمع بالعكس حيكون بأي بيت حتى موجود إنسان من ذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة هذا الشيء ما بيعني إنه العائلة فيها شيء نقص أو فيها شيء متعب بالعكس ممكن يكون دافع لشغلات أفضل من النورمال um, she uh, think that people with a special need, uh, there is nothing wrong with it. And these people, they can add to the community or even to the family that you live in. And that's how it should be. Um, so like, it's a lot about acceptance and, um, and not labeling people. I feel like it's, it's, it's what's coming across for me from what you are saying, and especially you know, same as what you said, Nudin, about being a refugee and not always being labeled as one um, and not having that as the only characteristic. Same applies also to people with disabilities. As you said earlier, there are so many other things that are part of who you are and part of your identity. So the next question is, someone, draws, so, someone write something, wrote something in Arabic. Um, I can read Arabic, but I can't read this. <laughs> but I will read, I will read the English uh, translation and pass then, then this on to Nadine. Uh, but the question is, what is lacking in the standard government services to foster a sense of belonging and agency? So what is currently lacking? Uh, what could government do better to foster a sense of belonging and agency? And here is the um, Arabic. Uh, oh. <laughs> Ah, uh, <laughs> um, um, I think I think it's more. I think um, uh, both cultures need more uh, need more exposure to each other, and need you know both both groups need to uh, get to know each other more in the sense that um, in the sense that you know. Um, the, the unfamiliar becomes familiar and, the, uh, and therefore accepted. Um, and that's not, not, just for, uh, not just for refugees, but also for people with, with disabilities, which I must say, Germany does very well. Um, but but what, I, what I would love to see is more, you know, is more, is more openness on both parts to, um, you know, to kind of get to know each other because um, you don't um, you don't fear uh, fear anything that you recognize and feel uh, feel comfortable with. Great, thank you, Eugene. Um So um, maybe now a question for both of you. Um, and um, so the question is, what would be your advice to the host countries communities um, to? Um, to make this process more smooth for, um, well, the question says, what would your advice be to the host countries, communities, to make this process more smooth for you? But my guess is that uh, the question is more smooth for like other refugees as well and people with disabilities. So what would your advice be? No, I, uh, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it should be approached only on our side or that we are the only ones who should be assisted because uh, the, ref uh, the refugee himself, uh, you know, has to take a responsibility in, in making a good good impression on the hosting country. Um, um, you know, the thing is, is that I maybe that that's just me. I don't like the you know the the concept of victimization. You know, you you just you know things happen in life, and you just get up and move on. But I think you know the really simple the really simple things. I mean. Just you know, I think you get the you, you get the vibe from your community. You get you get you get the 
you get the sense, you get the energy. And I think um, educate, uh, educating people on uh, other cultures and, and you know, uh, bringing, bringing them up, uh, especially from young age, to have, uh, to have compassion and curiosity about other cultures um, well, would, be a, would be of a great help in assisting in making the process uh, more smooth because you know they, they they would understand that you are you know they would understand your circumstances and have compassion for you and therefore be, be more patient and less you know less um, prejudiced against you thank you Najin Isreen would you like to add anything um, <laughs> مثل ما قالت نجيم انه هيك كاضافه انه اي شخص له شيء مميز فيه بغض النظر عن الاعاقه اذا كانت موجوده Yeah, she uh, support what her sister said also and she said every person has something special in him that he will be giving uh, to the society regardless of what his need or has a special need. Um, so we have a question that's similar to the last question that I asked which is um, please tell us your view of the future. Do you feel optimistic for the West and are you troubled by the rise of um, AFD, AFD in Germany? AFD. AFD in Germany. Yeah, that's the German pronunciation. Um, yes, I, I am troubled because it's, it's not just for me. Um, um, it, it, you know, it puzzles me more, uh, uh, you know, the fact that people need it to, you know, that felt the need to vote for such radical approaches. So what, what led them to think it, into thinking that um, AFD would be a good idea? Because, you know, um, yeah. um, Germany has a long history with radical thinking. And I would, I would more, uh, you know, I would, I am concerned very much about that. But I think that, um, I think that, you know, the, the political climate, you know, uh, other parties and, you know, um, are very self-conscious of what of what's happening, and are, you know, trying to take another direction. So, are trying to take you know, to to make people view AfD less positively. So, um, so that um, so since since there there is consciousness of the problem that's happening or of the uh, the tide that is rising, um, I hope that the, there will be you know there will be efforts. To, to, to make a change. Yeah. Mm. Mm. What she's recommending is that people, they live together regardless where in, uh, in where she come from or anywhere else and uh, understand each other. Absolutely. Um, I don't know, how, how do we stand with time? Mm -hmm. We have, okay, one last question. So I have no questions here, so I'll take one last question from the public, if there are any. Um, yes, sir. My question is, what can I do as an individual to help to raise that voice in the world? To help in people in society? Albert Marshall had a question, which is, what can I, as an individual, do to help and support people in dire situations like refugees? Well, <clears throat> I think there, 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 are, there, are, there are refugees everywhere. They are very easy to find. But I, I, um, as, it, as an individual, I think um, uh, Elda is doing very well. He's listening, uh, listening to us. And you know, that's the first step, you know, being conscious of the problem and then trying to do something about it. Um, I think there are, um, there are various, various, various um, but but is that help uh, refugees around the world? You could make a donation. You could even you know volunteer to work there. If you if you more, uh, want more uh, contact with refugees, 
So it's, it's really easy, I think, to get in, you know, to be active in terms of helping refugees and, uh, to, uh, and people with disabilities. Um, yeah, you just, you know, you just need to have the will, and I think it'll be easy. اللاجئ ما بيعني انه جاء مخلوق جاي من الفضاء هو نفسه انسان ممكن بالدين الدين مختلف او بتاريخ مختلف او بكلتور مختلف بس هو انسان المطلوب من الناس جميعا لما يسمعوا كلمه لاجئ هي ما بيعني وباء او مرض جاي على المجتمع هو بالعكس انسان حابب يندمج بهالمجتمع وعم عم يدور على فرصه جديده لحياه جديده بعيد عن الحرب وبعيد عن اي شيء سبب كان للجوء بس هو سؤالكم كيف بده يساعد اي كيف انه اي انسان يقدر انه يتقبل انه المطلوب من الشعب انه يتقبل هالشخص well she is saying that uh, everyone who is around just to accept a refugee that they are coming they are also a human being they didn't come from somewhere out of space and uh, slowly they will be part of the society. And if I can also add, so what meant a lot to us when we came to Sweden after three years of living in the Bosnian war was really, I still remember my neighbors who would knock on our door and want to get to know us and just people really reaching out and inviting over for dinner or inviting over for a birthday party or making sure that their children want to play with other refugee children. So really just reaching out to refugees in your community and making sure that they feel included. Um, so we have run out of time, but um, Najin and Isreen will be around today and tomorrow. Um, and I invite you all to speak with them. They have so much to offer and so much more to share. Um, I also have to say that Najin, she has also written an incredible book, which is called Najin. Um, and in which book she describes her story and everything that she has been through. Um, and I invite you all to, um, to, um, to read the book if you can. And um, yeah, and just thank you so much for listening to being here this morning. Thank you.